This video is sponsored by HelloFresh. Ever since I made a video over four years ago on Harlan Ellison's harrowingly bleak speculative science fiction, I have no mouth and I must scream, I have never stopped receiving requests to talk about Britain's bleakest film, Threads. Developed in the 80s as a docudrama based on the very real threat of nuclear warfare during the height of the Cold War, where the US and Soviet Union continuously fought over their positions as superpowers, Threads is a brutally uncompromising, research-intensive, hypothetical look at the UK's response to what if the bombs finally dropped. Set in the innocuous city of Sheffield, the story takes on a slice-of-life approach, switching between the intimate perspectives of the general public and civil servant officials thrust into managing the exacerbating conditions. The first half establishes a deeply tense and distressing tone similar to George A. Romero's Dawn of the Dead, where the presence of an impending apocalypse lingers heavily in the background through perpetual news coverage as people simply try to get on with their lives, blissfully unaware of how much this distant conflict will have an effect on their daily lives. Eventually, the reality will catch up with them, as the film opens with a profoundly eerie metaphor by actual science narrator Paul Vaughn, who discusses the intricacies of a spider creating its webs. The imagery of a spider's threads is that the world is a supremely and inescapably interconnected place. Actions and events that might seem so distant and inconsequential to our own personal stresses and struggles can affect us in a magnitude of ways. In an always timely fashion, we are ultimately all in this together. No thread is truly detached, and the only sheer essence of hope that exists is that when the world finally does crumble into dust, it is up to each and every one of us to work together to pick up the pieces and thread the world back together. However, as we unfortunately know, that's much easier said than done. Threads is truly one of the bleakest films I've ever experienced. It's aggressively matter-of-fact in its delivery, assaulting the viewer with disorientating urgency and unsympathetic statements via text and narration that confront us with only the cold, hard, unforgiving facts of what is truly happening. This isn't a film about morals or false idealism. It's a suffocating, depressing, and at times infuriating timeline of cause and effect, where innocent people far away from the conflict ends up right in the middle of it. We witness every possibility that could tangibly happen simply get worse and worse. Civil unrest and disorder leading to societal breakdown, panic buying leading to hyperinflation to the point of economic annihilation, nuclear winter causing ecological famine, and supply shortages forcing inadequate rationing to the extent that difficult decisions must be made as to whether food should be shared with those inevitably doomed to die from radiation sickness. Like, this movie thinks of everything to an obsessive degree. In fact, it gets excruciatingly specific that, by the end, efforts to reconstruct society make you question if being dead is better. Now, we will dive much deeper into this apocalyptic misery shortly, but there is some interesting context worth addressing to understand the UK's political climate at the time, which caused such an enigma like threads to be made. As always, as we go along, please leave your cheeky wee comments below, leave a like and subscribe to help out my channel, and lastly, I want to give a shout out to HelloFresh for gratefully sponsoring such a uh, difficult video, let's say. About two years ago, my partner got me into using HelloFresh because it's quick, convenient, and stress-free, all while providing me with great and unique tasting restaurant quality meals I can make right from my own kitchen, and also my parents' kitchen. I've said countless times before, but because of work, I rarely have the time to do anything like prep meals and go shopping, so to have HelloFresh get delivered literally to my doorstep with fresh ingredients and easy-to-follow recipes makes my life so much easier and introduces me to new and exciting foods and flavors I would otherwise never experience. Basically, each week I use the app to select from a variety of different recipes with customizable options to cater to carb, calorie, and dietary requirements, and HelloFresh does all the rest. For example, this week I've been cooking pulled barbecue chicken buns, pill pill inspired prawns, and lime glazed halloumi, mixing between high protein, low calorie, and taking on a veggie option because yes, I'm still that child who refuses to eat their vegetables and something has gotta change. As a terrible cook in general, HelloFresh 
Fresh's recipes actually make the process of cooking more rewarding and accessible, to the point I actually find it fun. And since I'm now cooking for two, my partner and I can share in the pastime mixing between quick 15 minute meals and more elaborate dishes, and it also gives me the chance to cook for my parents who typically stick to repetitive meals. So if you're looking for an easy way to eat well and save money in 2023 by cutting back on expensive takeout, simply use my link or go to hellofresh.com and use my code POG Ryan Jan 21 for 21 free meals plus free shipping. And hey, why not treat yourself to a cheeky wee dessert as well? <clears throat> Alright, so let's get into it. Commissioned by the British Broadcasting Corporation, or BBC, Threads is not exactly the kind of production you'd expect to see greenlit by the UK's largest broadcaster. That's because it's predominantly funded by TV licensing fees set by the British government, meaning that, as a taxpayer-funded broadcaster, it has a public duty to aggressively uphold impartiality and unbiased reporting, which, as you'd expect, falls under constant scrutiny by both sides of the political spectrum. Questions are typically raised over its political leanings, partially in response to whoever is the currently appointed Director General, each of which have had different perspectives over the years of what kind of content the BBC should be producing. In the case of Threads, it was commissioned by Director General Alistair Milne, who later resigned after facing increasing pressure from Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher's Tory government, who accused the BBC of mostly propagating left-wing values. Threads was basically Milne's effort to rectify for the cancellation of another 1966 BBC docudrama called The War Game, which also depicted the fallout of nuclear warfare. It didn't actually receive a television broadcast until 1985, a year after Threads released and on the 40th anniversary of the Hiroshima bombing, because the then Liberal government and the BBC felt it was too horrifying for broadcast. Instead, The War Game went on to have a theatrical release thanks to the British Film Institute, and subsequently won an Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature in 1967, so I consider that a better outcome in many ways. Anyway, Threads was not a film Thatcher's government would think too highly of, as one of its main criticisms outside the typical anti-war messaging was the perception that the UK government was ill-equipped and unprepared to deal with such a catastrophe, arguably in response to the volatile social unrest happening at the time. It was a sentiment also later depicted in Danny Boyle's 28 Days Later, which allegorically dealt with the government's perceived inadequate response to the 2001 foot and mouth epidemic, and in real life, let's not forget the uh, current situation of the Tory government. The only way Thatcher herself would think highly of Threads is if she were to view it as a working class snuff film, because under writer Barry Hines, who was best known for co-adapting his book, A Kestrel for a Nave, into 1969's Kez, with British kitchen sink filmmaker Ken Loach, Working class hardship is at the empathetic heart of threads. Kitchen sink realism is essentially Britain's artistic expression of working class lives, exploring themes of poverty, marginalisation, gritty inner city upbringing, blue collar occupations, and in general the stresses and burdens of just getting by in a harsh, uncaring world. Threads effectively falls into this as it seeks to relate to the lives of its characters than simply crushing your soul with nuclear destruction. The film's main protagonist is arguably Ruth, a young lady who plans to marry her boyfriend Jimmy after an unplanned pregnancy. We spend a fair bit of time getting to stand in their shoes and watch as they and their families deal with the financial burdens of a recession, welfare cuts and a volatile housing market that even has their families question if having a baby in the current climate is the right idea. Idea. It's very heavy stuff, there's a distinct verisimilitude to its portrayal of average life. These people are just trying to survive through tough times despite the global arms race escalating in urgency. Yes, they are concerned about the warfare, but you can understand it's not exactly the most pressing concern in their own private lives. There is a monotone pace to the film at first that helps to distinguish from the hysteria that naturally develops. There's a lack of sensationalism, dramatic music, or big, energetic personalities that sustains this intense believability that we're observing an enactment of an actuality. According to one source, Hines apparently didn't get on too well with Thread's director Mick Jackson because of his middle class upbringing, which I assume meant Hines questioned if Jackson could empathetically portray working class characters, but I think he nailed it. There is something delicate and forlorn about their lives, again contrasting with the bombastic destruction we're eventually faced with. In fact, one of the 
most interesting aspects of the government's perspective is that it isn't all high and mighty big talk politicians that take center stage. The situation is forced into the hands of civil servants who aren't adequately trained to cope with such intense pressures as they themselves are just ordinary people like the rest of us. Eventually, as the conflict reaches a tipping point, the government deployed the Emergency Powers Act and take militant control of the city in an effort to prepare for the worst, with panic buying, rioting and protests hitting immense heights. The war soon dominates the lives of everyone, as they make their own efforts to exit town, barricade their homes or simply accept the inevitable. Yet despite the utter bombardment of events happening in quick succession that it's difficult to keep up with them, reflect exactly how the general public feel, we're never truly prepared for when the bombs finally drop. The pacing of the film is immaculate. You really feel that accelerating urgency, but it's plagued with an uncertainty of when the worst will finally happen. And it does so just shy of the halfway point, slightly less than an hour into the film to be exact. The handle warning is sounded and the people scatter. A single warhead abruptly explodes high above the North Sea, causing an energy pulse to burn out electricity. Two minutes later, the first missile hits a NATO military target, causing a shockwave over the city of Sheffield, miles from the location. A mushroom cloud appears as people race to find and help their loved ones, and then, for the first time in the film, complete silence. Fire rains down on the characters we've come to care for. We're no longer in Sheffield, we're basically in hell. From here, we decompress from the crescendo. The pace slows back down as we bear witness to blistering winds spreading radioactive dust into the lungs of helpless survivors as a cold nuclear winter begins. For 1984, you can imagine how harrowing this film was, given its efforts at conveying fact and authenticity. The cindering of millions of corpses, the slow, agonizing deaths of those still partially standing, a smoldering wasteland of an unrecognizable home. It's the quietness of it all, the shock of a nightmare we never hoped for, that makes it so terrifying. There is stuff in here I frankly cannot show. Image that is so repulsive for YouTube, from emergency amputations to disease running rampant, to the government inflicting martial law and executing looters on the streets. However, I think the detail that provokes me the most is that the plot threads then deliberately disintegrate. Suddenly you lose track of every character, with some even disappearing completely without resolution. For example, for all the time we spend with Jimmy, the last we see of him is him rushing home to get to Ruth before the bombs fall. And and it's honestly safe to assume he's probably dead, because when his friend meets Ruth in a camp weeks later, they're both lost on what to think about it. They're so desperate just trying to survive in the midst of sickness, exhaustion and starvation, that they just don't have the energy to grieve anymore. Reconstruction eventually begins as food replaces money as the new currency, and hard labour is enforced to make the most of what dying crops are left before machinery fails altogether. The point it makes in its withering despair is that nothing will ever return to normal. Hell, we're told that society has practically reverted back to medieval times. There's no glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel, no magical cure for the world's sickness. Thread sticks to its truth ending 10 years after Ruth gives birth to a child she calls Jean, who one day witnesses her mother die before her eyes, but is left completely numb to it. We're left living in a world where death and disease are so common that it's a normal expectation. With morality nearly gone, Jean is one day assaulted during a desperate struggle for food, and later gives birth to an unwanted baby, leaving her in absolute fear and agony. Negatively reflecting back on the journey we started with, where Ruth and Jimmy simply wanted to start a peaceful, loving family. Alright, can I stop talking about this movie now?